All right, this is The Graveyard Book by Neil Gaiman, Chapter 5, Dance Macabre. Something was going on. Bod was certain of it. It was there in the crisp winter air, in the stars, in the wind, in the darkness. It was there in the rhythms of the long nights and the, of the fleeting days. Mr. Owens pushed him out of the Owens' little tomb. Get along with you, she said. I've got business to attend to. Bod looked at his mother. But it's cold out there. I should hope so, she said. It's it being winter. That's as it should be. Now, she said more to the, herself than to Bod. Shoes and look at this dress. It needs hemming and cobwebs. There are cobwebs all over, for heaven's sakes. You get along, this to Bod once more. I've plenty to be getting on with. I don't need you underfoot. And then she sang to herself a little couplet Bod had never heard before. Rich man, poor man, come away, come dance to the macabre. What's that? asked Bod, but it was the wrong thing to have said, for Mistress Owens looked, oops, Mrs. Mistress Owens looked dark as thun a thundercloud, and Bod hurried out of the tomb before she could express her displeasure more forcefully. It was cold in the graveyard, cold and dark, and the stars were already out. Bod passed Mother Slaughter in the ivy-covered Egyptian walk, squinting at the greenery. Your eyes are younger than mine, young man, she said. Can you see Blossom? Blossom? In winter? Don't you look at me with that face on, young man, she said. Things blossom in their time. They bud and bloom, blossom and fade, everything in its time. She huddled deeper into her cloak and bonnet, and she said, Time to work, time to play, time to dance the macabre, eh, boy? I don't know, said Bod. What's the macabre? But Mother Slaughter had pushed into the ivy and was gone from sight. How odd, said Bod aloud. He sought warmth and company in the bustling Bartleby mausoleum. But the Bartleby family, seven generations of them, had no time for him that night. <coughs> they were cleaning and tidying, all of them, from the oldest, died in 1831, to the youngest, died in 1690. <coughs> Fortinbra Bartleby, ten years old, when he had died of consumption, he had been told he had told Bod, who was mistakenly believed for several years that Fortinbra had been eaten by lions or bears and was extremely disappointed to learn it was merely a disease, now apologized to Bod. We cannot stop to play, Master Bod, for soon enough tomorrow night comes. And how often can a man say that? Every night, said Bod, tomorrow night always comes. Not this one, said Fortinbra, not once in a blue moon or a month of Sundays. It's not Guy Fox night, said Bod, or Halloween. It's not Christmas or New Year's Day. Fortinbra smiled, a huge smile that filled his pie-shaped, freckly face with joy. None of them, he said. This one's special. What's it called, asked Bod. What happens tomorrow? It's the best day, said Fortinbra, and Bod was certain he would have continued, but his grandmother, Louisa Bartleby, who was only 20, called him over to her and said something sharply in his ear. Nothing, said Fortinbra, then to Bod. Sorry, I have to work now. And he took a rag and began to buff the side of his dusty coffin with it. La, 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 oomp, he sang. La, 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 oomp. And with the each oomph, he would do a wild, whole-body flourish, flourish with his rag. Aren't you going to sing that song? What song? The one everybody's singing? No time for that, said Fortinbra. It's tomorrow. Tomorrow, after all. No time, said Louisa, who had died in childbirth, giving birth to twins. Be about your business. And in her sweet, clear voice, she sang... One and all will hear and stay. Come and dance the macabre. Bod walked down to the crumbling little church. He slipped between the stones and into the crypt, where he sat and waited for Silas to return. He was cold, true, but the cold did not bother Bod. Not really. The graveyard embraced him, and the dead do not mind the cold. His guardian returned in the small hours of the morning. He had a large plastic bag with him. What's in there? Clothes, for you. Try them on. Silas produced a gray sweater the color of Bod's winding sheet, a pair of jeans, underwear, and shoes, pale green sneakers. What are they for? You mean, apart from wearing? Well, firstly, I think you're old enough. 
what are you, 10 years old now? And normal living people, clothes are wise. For normal living people, clothes are wise. You'll have to wear them one day, so why not pick up the habit right now? And they could also be camouflage. What's camouflage? When something looks enough like something else that people watching don't know what it is they're looking at. Oh, I see. I think. Bob put the clothes on. The shoelaces gave him a little trouble, and Silas had to teach him how to tie them. It seemed remarkably complicated to Bod, and he had to tie and retie his laces several times before he had done it to Silas's satisfaction. Only then did Bod dare ask his question. Silas, what's a macabre? Silas's eyebrows raised and his head tipped to one side. Where did you hear about that? Everyone in the graveyard is talking about it. I think it's something that happens tomorrow night. What's a macabre? It's a dance, said Silas. All must dance the macabre, said Bod, remembering. Have you danced it? What kind of dance is it? His guardian looked at him with eyes like black pools and said, I do not know. I know many things, Bod, for I have been walking this earth at night for a very long time, but I do not know what it is like to dance the macabre. You must be alive or you must be dead to dance it, and I am neither. Bod shivered. He wanted him to embrace this guard, his guardian, to hold him and tell him that he would never desert him, but the action was unthinkable. He could no more hug Silas than he could hold a moonbeam, not because his guardian was insubstantial, but because it would be wrong. There were people you could hug, and then there was Silas. His guardian inspected Bod thoughtfully, a boy in his new clothes. You'll do, he said. Now, now you look like you've lived outside the graveyard all your life. Bod smiled proudly. Then the smile stopped and looked grave once again. He said, but you'll always be here, Silas, won't you? And I won't ever have to leave if I don't want to. Everything in its season, said Silas, and he said he had no more that night. Bod woke early the next day when the sun was a silver coin high in the gray winter sky. It was too easy to sleep through the hours of daylight to spend all his winter in one long night and never see the sun. And so each night before he slept, he would promise he would, himself that he would wake in the daylight and leave the Owens' his cozy tune. There was a strange scent in the air, sharp and floral. Bod followed it up the hill to the Egyptian walk where, there, the, where the winter ivy hung in green tumbles, an evergreen tangle that hid the mock Egyptian walls and statues and hieroglyphs. The perfume was heaviest there, and for a moment, Bod wondered if snow might have fallen, for there were white clusters on the greenery. Bod examined a cluster more closely, and it was made of small, five-petaled flowers. And he had just put his head in to sniff the perfume when he heard footsteps coming up the path. Bod faded into the ivy and watched. Three men and a woman, all alive, came up the path and into the Egyptian walk. The woman had an ornate chain around her neck. Is this it? she asked. Yes, Mrs. Carraway, said one of them, chubby and white-haired and short of breath. Like each of the men, he carried a large, empty wicker basket. She seemed both vague and puzzled. Well, if you say so, she said, but I cannot say that I understand it. She looked up at the flowers. What do I do now? The smallest of the men reached into his wicker basket and brought out a tarnished pair of silver scissors. The scissors, Lady Mayoress, he said. She took the scissors from him and began to cut the clumps of blossom, and she and the three men started to fill the baskets with flowers. This is, said Mrs. Carraway, the lady mayoress, after a little while, perfectly ridiculous. It is, said the fat man, a tradition. Perfectly ridiculous, said Mrs. Carraway, but she continued to cut the white blossoms and drop them into the wicker baskets. When they had filled the first basket, she asked, is that enough? We need to fill all four baskets, said the smaller man, then distribute a flower to everyone in the old town. And what kind of tradition is that? Asked, said Mrs. Carraway. I asked the Lord Mayor before me, and he said he'd never heard of it. Then she said, do you get a feeling some, someone's watching us? What, said the third man, who had not spoken until now. He had a beard and a turban and two wicker baskets. Ghosts, you mean? I do not believe in ghosts. Not ghosts, said Mrs. Carraway, just a feeling like someone's looking. Bod fought the urge to push further back into the ivy. 
It's not surprising that the previous Lord Mayor did not know about this tradition, said the chubby man, whose basket was almost full. It's the first time the winter blossoms have bloomed in 80 years. The man with the beard and the turban, who did not believe in ghosts, was looking around him nervously. Everyone in the old town gets a flower, said the small man. Man, woman, and child. Then he said slowly, as if he were trying to remember something he had learned a very long time ago. One to leave and one to stay, and all to dance the macabre. Mrs. Carraway sniffed. Stuff and nonsense, she said, and kept on snipping the blossoms. Dusk fell early in the afternoon, and it was night by half past four. Bod wandered the paths of the graveyard, looking for someone to talk to, but there was no one about. He walked down to the potter's field to see if Liza Hempstock was about, but found no one there. He went back to the Owens' tomb, but also found it deserted. Neither his father nor Mr. Sowens was anywhere to be seen. Panic started then, a low-level panic. It was the first time in his ten years that Bod could remember feeling abandoned in the place he had always thought of as his home. He ran down the hill to the old chapel where he waited for Silas. Silas did not come. Perhaps I missed him, said thought Bod, and, but he did not believe this. He walked up to the hill to the very top and looked out. The stars hung in the chilly sky while the patterned lights of the city spread below him. Street lights and car headlights and things in motion. He walked slowly down from the hill until he reached the graveyard's main gates. He stopped there. He could hear music. Bod had listened to all kinds of music. The sweet chimes of the ice cream van, the songs that played on the workmen's radios, the tunes that clicked. Clarity Jake played the dead on his dusty fiddle, but he had never heard anything like this before. A series of deep swells, like the music at the beginning of something, a prelude perhaps, or an overture. He slipped through the locked gates, walked down the hill, and into the old town. He passed the Lady Mayoress standing on a corner, and as he watched, she reached out and pinned a little white flower to the lapel of the passing businessman. I don't make personal charitable donations, said the man. I leave that to the office. It's not for charity, said Mrs. Carraway. It's a local tradition. Ah, he said as he pushed his chest out, displaying the little white flower to the world and walked off, proud as punch. A young woman pushing a baby buggy was next to go past. What's it for? she asked suspiciously as the mayoress approached. One for you, one for the little one, said the mayoress. She pinned the flower on the young woman's winter coat. She stuck the flower for the baby to its coat with tape. But what's it for? asked the young woman. It's an old town thing, said the lady mayoress vaguely. Some sort of tradition. Bod walked on. Everywhere he went, he saw people wearing the white flowers. On the other street corners, he passed men who had been with the lady mayoress, each man with a basket handing out the white flowers. Not everyone took a flower, but most people did. The music was still playing somewhere at the edge of perception, solemn and strange. Bod cocked his head to one side, trying to locate where it was coming from without success. It was the, in the air all around. It was playing in the flapping of flags and awnings, in the rumble of distant traffic, the click of heels on the dry paving stones. And there was an oddness, thought Bod, as he watched people heading home. They were walking in time to the music. I think we'll stop here because we're halfway through this longer chapter.